Good day. My name is Anthony Quayle. I've been asked to speak to you about Europe and America. Yes, big subject. Two different continents, different cultures, different people. Take Holland, for example. Now, what could be more different from America than a land of windmills and wooden shoes? Oh, sorry about that. There is a Holland in America, of course. All right, let's try Italy then. Oh, we seem to have done it again. Uh, let's try France. No, seems to be Canada. Now I'm confused. can be no mistake about this. Forgive me playing games with you like that, but it does seem to make the point. We're always so ready to dwell on our differences, but why, in these critical times, don't we take a look at all the things we have in common? There are so many misconceptions on both sides of the Atlantic. Many people persist in thinking of America as a new country. But the 200-year-old government of the United States is one of the most venerable in the world. Older than the governments of Greece, Italy, Belgium, France, Norway, Spain, Germany, Russia, China, India, and most of the other governments in the world. Still, in outlook, and attitude, America is a nation marked by the youth and vigor of her people. One of its young men, with typical Yankee zeal, set out to capture two centuries of American history in a remarkable three-minute film.
fascinating. 200 years of American history in three minutes. But to round out the story, we should add a few items. And just to be provocative, I would like to suggest that the American Revolution did not begin in 1776. That it was not altogether an American Revolution. And that it did not end in 1783. To show you what I mean, let's go back once again to the beginning. No, not here. At the beginning of the revolution. No, a bit further still. We need more pictures, so it seems. Let's see if this will help. Baruch Spinoza was born a Dutch Jew. In the late 1600s, he lived and wrote in this house in Holland. He wrote philosophical things like this. I believe democracy to be, of all forms of government, the most natural and the most consonant with individual liberty. If you think that sounded American, listen to this from an Englishman who came along a few years later, John Locke. Locke spoke of natural rights and of men being free and equal. And he said, government is derived from the consent of the governed. The 18th century Americans drew guidance and inspiration from a hundred generations of Europeans, from thinkers like the German Leibniz, and the Frenchman, Voltaire, Montesquieu, Descartes, and Rousseau, right back to the Roman, Marcus Aurelius, back further to the Greeks, to Socrates. So, where did the revolution begin? Thousands of years of European thought were invested in this new land. Certainly, the influence must be acknowledged of more than a million Native American Indians of a quarter of a million Africans brought here as slaves. But, for better or worse, in good ways and bad, the dominant influence on 18th century America clearly came from the three million people of European heritage. They did what others had only talked about. They came to America and made a revolution. And once the actual fighting started, many more Europeans pitched in on both sides. From France, Lafayette, Rochambeau, De Grasse, De Stein. From Poland, Kosciusko and Pulaski. From England, Tom Paine. From Germany, von Steuben. And there were thousands of nameless Europeans sent by their monarchs to fight on a continent that bore names like New France, New Amsterdam. New England, New Spain. I've already suggested that the American Revolution actually started way before 1776. I further contend that it continued long after the surrender at Yorktown. But it took different forms. 
social, cultural, legal, and of course, scientific. In the yeasty 19th century Atlantic world of exploration and invention, with this contraption, a young Scotsman, James Watt, started the Industrial Revolution. That was on the European side of the Atlantic. On the American side of the Atlantic, McCormack and Deer conceived some new machines. Farming was revolutionized. Lured by a fertile, abundant America, nearly 30 million Europeans, most of them farmers, migrated to America between 1821 and 1900. Thus, with each migratory surge of the 19th century, the interaction between America and Europe grew stronger. For more than a century, the human river flowed mostly from Europe westward to America. Around the turn of the 20th century, the flow from Europe had subsided, and a terrible new stage of involvement began as the two most hellish wars in history reversed the flow. At first, Americans tried to remain neutral, to stay isolated, but history would not have it so. Back they came to Europe in their tens of thousands, the children of those German, Dutch, Polish, Scandinavian, Irish, French and Italian farmers, back they sailed to join in the struggle. of America tipped the balance, but all Europe was the loser. After World War I, President Wilson's efforts to bring the United States into the dialogue of nations was an attempt to break America out of isolation. But America was not ready. Wilsonian idealism was rejected. For a century, Americans had felt that they could remain aloof behind the barriers of their shining seas. Indeed, the American posture of noble isolationism was rooted in the view that America should, in George Washington's words, avoid foreign entanglements. This meant especially European entanglements. In the dark days of the 40s, isolationism did not dissolve it was shattered. unbelievable agony of World War II. The seed of a new awareness was planted. An historic seed, which sprouted and flourished into the modern concepts of Atlantic alliance and interdependence the price of understanding came high. But from all this came a great moment in American history. 
Republican Senator Arthur A. Vandenberg of Michigan and Democratic Senator Tom Connolly of Texas joined forces to lead Congress in the development of a bipartisan foreign policy, giving President Truman the support of a united country. America made a revolutionary commitment. It assumed a major role in post-war world affairs. A solid Congress made possible the Greek-Turkish aid program. The Marshall Plan. and NATO. The military security of Western Europe was established. Full economic recovery was made possible. Americans, such as Marshall and Hoffman, worked with some great Europeans, England's Ernest Bevin, Germany's Adenauer, France's Schumann and Monet, Belgium's Spark, Italy's De Gasperi, to raise a continent out of the ashes. Someone once said, every man has two cities, his own and Paris. In the wake of the great wars, it could be said with equal truth that every European had two countries, his own and America. These things are remembered. But not all is sweetness and light. The Soviet Union and the Eastern European countries were invited to join in the Marshall Plan to cooperate in the rebuilding. But the communists had other ideas. A different kind of unity was imposed in Eastern Europe, and it threatened to engulf the people of the West as well. America and Western Europe came face to face with one of the compelling realities of the 20th century. The security of Western Europe and the security of the United States are one and the same. Thanks to NATO and the Marshall Plan, Europe and America got safely through the Cold War era. During this period, hundreds of thousands of young American soldiers and their families added to the stream of American tourists and professional people flowing eastward across the Atlantic. come as citizens of the Atlantic community, protecting their present, ensuring their future. And as it was during the revolution, the days of the great migrations and wars, the alliance is mostly a young person's game. And it's a two-way street. Together, young Europeans and Americans work with new concepts funded by the energy of youth. NATO, with its emphasis on interdependence, has made detente possible. Yes, we have our problems, serious ones. Some Americans say more of the defense burden should be carried by Europeans. On the other hand, Europeans reply that 75% of the NATO Air Force Eighty percent of the NATO fleet and ninety percent of NATO ground forces are already European. There are differences over oil and money policies. Some people fear that U.S.-Soviet negotiations 
might be the cause of a declining American interest in Europe. The Mediterranean area, and indeed the entire Atlantic community, is a melange of political, economic, and military problems. The very complexity of our affairs seems to dilute the will that was so firm when the issue seemed simpler during the Cold War. Nevertheless, most of us recognize the need for our alliance if we are to have any hope of moving safely into the future. There is still a threat to our freedom, and that freedom is worth defending. The trouble is, under our Western democratic systems, we have had freedom so long, we've come to take it for granted. It has lost its revolutionary flavor. We, in the Atlantic community, see our right to criticize, oppose, and peaceably advocate changes in government as evolutionary. But this freedom to speak out, which we have made part of our nature, well, behind the Iron Curtain, the introduction of such freedoms would indeed be revolutionary. So, I think of the open societies of the Atlantic community as having produced what one might call the permanent revolution of Western man. This freedom is the true revolution. All this was summed up in four words by an American president talking to a hundred thousand Europeans. Ich bin ein Berliner. There it is. I am a Berliner. I am a Parisian. I am a Roman. I am a New Yorker. I'm a Nebraskan. I'm a European. I am an American. We're all saying the same thing. I am free. Maybe we cannot pinpoint precisely the moment of his conception or the hour of his birth. But it happened, didn't it? I think this is as good a time as any in honor of that elusive moment in history to say to you, to me, to America, to Europe, and to everybody in the world who ever wanted to light a candle in the darkness, happy birthday. Happy birthday from Venice, California. Venezia, Italia. Athens, Greece. Athens, Ohio. Amsterdam, Holland. Amsterdam, New York. Copenhagen, Denmark. Copenhagen, New York. London, England. London, Canada. Paris, France. Paris, Kentucky. Florence, Italia. Florence, Arizona. Elsinore, Denmark. Elsinore, California. Cambridge, England. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Hoboken, Belgium. Hoboken, New Jersey. Luxembourg. Luxembourg, Wisconsin. Bergen, Norway. Bergen, New Jersey. Orléans, France. New Orleans, Louisiana. Milano, Italia. My land, Texas. Versailles, France. Versailles, Kentucky. Bremen, Germany. Bremen, Indiana. Holland. Holland, Michigan.